I'm Brian Seth Hurst in Los Angeles. And I'm Alison Norrington in London, and welcome to the Story Hour. Please feel free to subscribe, like, and comment below. The Story Hour sits at the intersection of storytelling and technology. We bring you the story behind the story, how it's written, how it's produced, how it's distributed, and even the personal stories behind the storytellers themselves. We talk with the master writers, producers, directors, authors, and technologists, covering it all from film and television to literature, virtual and augmented reality, and more as well as the innovations in production, technology, and distribution that are changing the how of storytelling. Our guest today is a writer-director who combines film and storytelling with interactivity to create new types of screen-based experiences. For this, he's won a BAFTA, an Emmy, six Webbies, a Grand Clio, and Best in Book in Creative Review, and many other awards. He has worked with brands including Google, the British Film Institute, the National Theatre, Tate Britain and Tate Modern. He has directed talent including Gordon Ramsay, Sir Derek Jacobi and Sir Ian McKellen, and even gave Daisy Ridley her first acting job. He's the creator of Lifesaver, Lifesaver VR, Heart Class, Real Talk About Suicide, a conversation with Ian McKellen and many others. His latest work, filmed during the lockdown focuses on the climate emergency in two-hour Zoom sessions that combine interactive film with political debate. We are thrilled to welcome our guest today, whose mission is to turn viewers into doers. A guy with a big heart and an ambitious plan to reframe the way that film can empower people with the skills to save lives or fight climate change. Welcome, Martin Percy. Hello, Martin. Hello, welcome everybody, thank you. How are you, Martin? I'm good. I'm good. Lovely to see you. You too. It's um, it's great that I was thinking about this earlier. You know, we're all storytellers, and as as we prepared for this, we're in lockdown. You're in lockdown in the UK. We're in lockdown in Los Angeles. Everybody now has a story about lockdown. But Martin, it's great to have you today because it 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 means just when I was reading the introduction. It means just because we're in lockdown doesn't mean we're not able to contribute. We're not able to make a difference. We're not able to point to subject matters that might be difficult to discuss. And the things that you cover are kind of exacerbated by the circumstance. So I, I'm going to turn it over to Allison, but I just want to say I'm grateful for the content that you've created uh, because it's a resource for Thank people you. in lockdown now. Sure. Absolutely. 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 Yeah, no, I mean... Sorry, go on, Martin. Uh, so... What I feel is that we can create things online which do a lot of the jobs which traditionally were done face to face. So, for example, one thing that you mentioned was a film I made called Real Talk About Suicide, uh, which is about how to talk to someone who's feeling suicidal. And the thing is that generally that's only handled in face to face conversations, but we can find ways to teach those things online so that people don't need to find you know, an expensive specialist to talk to first. Uh, I mean, it's not in any way a replacement for talking to a psychiatrist or anything like that, but it's a guide for lay people. Um, and obviously the lockdown has, as you know so well, has kind of horrifically accentuated the psychological pressures that lots of people are living under, and it makes tools like this even more useful than they were in the old days. And you know, as we've gone there, with the real talk about suicide i'm going to dive straight into that because i was actually really surprised and i've spoken to you about this before at the directness of the question between the two characters right so i was always sort of more led to believe that i don't know you don't know it's like when somebody passes away people don't know how to have that conversation and i know that you didn't work in isolation on that but i was for me, yeah, it really opened up some thoughts around how to address if you are confronted with somebody that you feel is not only depressed but also potentially suicidal. There was a very directness to the questions of that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I hasten to point out I am not an expert. Ex I hasten to point out I am not an expert on suicide prevention. Just like I'm not an expert in CPR, I'm not an expert in climate change or any of the other things that I have been fortunate enough to make films about. I'm an interactive filmmaker, and I work with people who are experts. Uh, and in the case of Real Talk About Suicide, uh, a, a grassroots suicide prevention, uh, which is a charity in the UK, uh, 
contacted me because they'd seen other things that I had done, and they said, well, why don't we try and do something similar, but dealing with a topic which traditionally has people have believed to be kind of beyond the realms of what can be handled by something which exists online uh, and um, and so that's we'll talk about suicide and so far it's been very effective but it's just a beginning you know it's just one small film it's about two white guys fairly old white guys talking to each other because that is a particular demographic which in the UK um, suffers the most appalling um, loss rate from suicide but of course we desperately want to make one for women for teenagers all sorts of other groups that are you know, um, under pressure and now of course even more um, under pressure so I really hope that that will be like a little demonstration of hey look what you can do doesn't mm -hmm. just have to be a website with some text and maybe a PowerPoint if you're going to go like crazy um, mm -hmm. if you take film which as we know is fantastic at generating emotional response and a sense of emotional reality and if you combine that with interactivity to create something where you don't just sit passively as a couch potato and watch you actually have to make decisions in order to get the film to the place you want it to go if you create something like that then you can create a tool which is um, really effective in teaching people how to do things and the topics you choose, actually, I feel naturally lend themselves to that waking up moment. And I know you've said about turning viewers into doers, but I also like at one point you did say to me that you get them out of couch potato mode. It's well, so exactly. So I think the, but it has to be the right topic. Right. Now, I assume many people who are listening or watching here today are thinking, Oh my God, another guy who thinks that I want to choose the ending of a movie. So what I would suggest is that what I'm talking about is not fictional stories. That what, I, what I'm doing is I'm taking subjects where um, it's a simulation of a real life experience. And the simulation is built using live action film and interactivity. Uh, and... Um, by making that kind of simulation, you can create something where you, where people at the end will get will get an ability to do something that they couldn't do before. Now, if you don't want to turn viewers into doers, that's totally fine. And let's face it, you know, Game of Thrones, they don't want people to end the the you know watching an episode with a newly enhanced ability to um, seize kingdoms from you know their opponents. They want you to just sit there and have a good time and watch the movie, and at the end you love it, and you know you come back next week and watch the next episode. That's fine. That's fine. So we're not talking about something which is relevant to that sort of topic. We're talking about something where we want to turn viewers into doers. But we, I think, Martin, if I can yeah. interrupt, I think what is relevant is the storytelling aspect. I mean, you can say, you know, Game of Thrones is great storytelling. But what you do is also great storytelling. And where people can identify with characters in a story or where they can put themselves in the story, that's the magic of storytelling to begin with. The moment I am able to enter a story world and feel I'm a part of it, or identify with specific characters. I wanted to go back a little bit and ask you how you got into this. Like, what was the motivation for you to say, well, was it you that said, I have to do something and therefore this is what I'm gonna do? So I'd love a little background on how you ended up in interactive storytelling that actually makes a difference. Sure, well, so in the early 2000s, Brian, Satan visited me. And there was a huge puff of smoke. Can I just say, and you, weren't, said, the only, you weren't the only one who he visited. <laughs> fine, but well, that's fine. And uh, he said, Martin, interactivity, film, put them together and you'll make a fortune. And then disappeared in a, you know, another yes, puff of Satan smoke. Yes, but Satan always asks for something in return. So what did you lose? <laughs> just kidding. Well, everything. And like, where's the money I was supposed to be <laughs> making? Where's the, where's the world, you know? Um, so, uh, yeah, no. That's one possible thing that happened. Another possible thing happened was that way back in the 20th century, 
which I think, Brian, you can remember. Alison, I'm not sure if you can remember. But um, uh, so um, I, I don't know who you're think... talking to. No, please go ahead. Okay, Brian can't remember it either, but I can remember it. So back in the uh, 20th century, I used to direct, you know, good old linear film and TV, and I shot TV commercials and um, and uh, documentaries and things like that. But I could never think of anything that I could do which hadn't already been done so much better by Truffaut or Jane Campion or you know whoever you you know might like to mention. Uh, then in the early 2000s, uh, sorry, sort of 99, 99, late 99, mid 99, um, I discovered that there was this thing called the internet. And I started working pure internet for a couple of years. For a couple of years, I didn't shoot a single frame of video, uh, not a single frame of film. Uh, I just worked making websites. Um, and because what I was convinced of was that if we could take the stuff that we love about film and fuse it with all this incredible new stuff that was possible with this internet thing, then we would, could create an incredible new medium. And that is what I have been working on ever since. Uh, you know, the, it's funny, Martin. I have to say, I think Allison and I had had a similar pathway. Um, so call it visionary, but... To be able to see, first thing I want to say is, um, just for people watching, to be able to have enough self-awareness to recognize where your expertise might not be, and to be able to evaluate that and say, okay, am I going to put energy into that, or is there another place of focus? So having that awareness, because sometimes people hold on to a dream so desperately that they lose their objectivity. And that's a lot about what the Story Hours is about, is how, how you get to where you're on mission or on purpose, what that story is. So that's the first thing. The second thing is this ability to see a convergence, which is a huge thing right now. The convergence of technologies, the convergence of, you know, if, if it weren't for the internet and it weren't for things like Zoom coming together, there would be no telemedicine. And so it affects everything. So here you are one of those people who is about the convergence of technology and seeing it and then saying, at least this is my perception, so correct me if I'm wrong, seeing it and then saying, I have this toolbox in front of me. How can I use these tools to enable the stories I want to tell? And in your case, to be able to make the difference with the stories I want to tell. So hope that's a fair assessment. Uh, it, it is, it is, except the only thing I would say is that uh, I'm astonished that so little has changed in the first 20 years of the uh, internet. That, um, when you I found say that, interview... what do you mean by so little has changed? So in 2000, I did an interview with a now long vanished magazine, um, and I said that okay, at the moment over here are the film and TV people, over here are the internet people, and in the middle there's this big empty space. And what happens is that, obviously in 2000 this didn't happen very often, but in, on the then rare occasions that people do make a video for the internet, the film and TV people make it and then they chuck it over a glass wall to the internet people who code it up and stick a pause button and a play button on it and then it's ready for the internet. Um, what I was confidently predicting would happen was that this gap would be filled up and this glass wall would shatter and the, the, the boundaries between film and TV people and interactive people would blur. Now, in the last 20 years, I'm shocked how little this has happened creatively. Uh, technically, it's all possible, but what's happened creatively is we still have the film and TV people on the whole, and most of the time they're now making material for the internet, but they're still acting like it's 1980s cinema. You know, the, most YouTube videos um, are still made as if, you know, it's to be played in a sort of big old cinema with sort of people watching adoringly from the stalls. Uh, and of course, you've got these sort of ironies with something like Netflix, 
where, of course, Netflix is unique amongst the constant content creators in that it's a Silicon Valley startup. You know, it's got it's got the internet absolutely baked into its DNA. And yet still with Netflix programs, the vast majority are still made as if for regular telly. It's just Martin, TV. Um, now I know, so just just allow me to finish because I think there are some mm -hmm. viewers who are going to be thinking, but what about, but what about, what about? So obviously Netflix have done a tiny little experiment with a few interactive pieces, but uh, you know, van you know, what is like a fraction of a fraction of a percent. Um, on the whole, film and TV people are still making film and TV as if for 20th century television and cinema, and I'm astonished how little has changed in terms of creatively <clears throat> using the medium. And, uh, yes. Do you, think, so was, do you think it might be due, well, one, I, I think it might be due to something generational in terms of the institutionalization of the system, which I think may be being rocked right now. <clears throat> so it might be times like this because I had a conversation yesterday with a film finance person. I'd been offered an opportunity to invest in a film and he said to me, Brian, the analysts are going nuts. We are really trying to figure out what the audience is doing, what we're going to do. And if, in terms of independent film, you can forget investing in that for now because people, the, the, even the real films don't know what to do with their money. But what <clears throat> I'm asking you is, do you think it's also an, an absence of data? <clears throat> so not knowing how the audience will interact and not knowing how you can make money from that interaction. And I, now I understand what you're saying because you still have the separation. You have ad networks that are marrying ads to traditional stuff and all the interactivity is taking place over on Twitter. And, and you know, the audience is interacting while they're watching the show with each other. They're just not interacting with the show. With the show. So do you think it's the absence of data and business models that has slowed that down? <clears throat> Fundamentally, I think it's a creative vacuum. That, that there are so few people coming up with an idea which could generate any data that was worthwhile. So I think, you know, yes, you're absolutely right, Brian. There's an absence of data. Why is there an absence of data? Because there's nothing to build your data around. So going back to the Netflix example, obviously the net, you know, Netflix are masters of data and data collection. And I applaud them for having this idea of piloting a few um, interactive films and no doubt someone was saying well this will be great we'll get lots of data about whether this interactive thing works or not but the problem is that in my humble opinion the interactive pieces that they have come up with are not going to give them any useful data at all They've, you know, the, the interactive work they've done so far I would personally suggest falls into two categories. There's Bandersnatch, uh, which is a brilliant, ironic model of a 1980s choose your own adventure book, warts and all. Um, you know, Charlie Brooker is a genius and he has deliberately made it. So it's this kind of mad tangle of kind of confusing plot lines with endless sort of pointless choices that go nowhere and a whole range of completely inconsistent endings. So you have no sense with Bandersnatch that you're kind of discovering a world. You get to one ending and it's one world. You get to another ending and it's a completely contradictory world. So your main thought is like an, is a distancing, ironic, well, that's mad. <laughs> and, and that's the way it works. Charlie Brooker's a genius. That's what he's trying to do. He's making a model of a 1980s um, Choose Your Own Adventure book. Choose Your Own Adventure trademark. Um, let's not forget. Uh, um, and so that's Bandersnatch. So that will generate data about a very complicated winding way of making interactive films, which if you want to make another Bandersnatch, gives you some useful data. If you don't, it's completely useless. Then there are all the other um, uh, Netflix interactive films where I would humbly suggest that there are some fundamental failures of understanding about how interactive film works. Above all, a lack of jeopardy. 
So take, for example, uh, you know, there was an adventure film, an adventure series that uh, Netflix came up with, which was a wonderful premise in some ways because you had a protagonist who was going to be faced with some sort of life-threatening situations. And survival situations are great for interactive film because you don't have problems with like character motivation and the puppet master problem uh, which I can talk about later you know just, just anyone in that situation would want to survive so you know what your aim is you've got to survive it's just how to do it so they had this series but so th and they gave you various kind of life or death choices but whichever way one you chose you would survive and if you didn't make a choice, the system would make a choice for you. So it completely destroyed the fundamentals of interactive drama because there was no jeopardy. There was no need for you to make a choice. If you made the wrong choice, it didn't matter because the hero would still live to get on to the um, choice. So they just destroyed what interactive film can do in that sort of situation. And so they will have lots of data saying, oh, well, interactive film sucks. Look, look at this data. You know, every, you know the, like, the people are giving up after the third choice. And this is something which has happened repeatedly yeah. since it's the early 90s with interactive, interactive is that very often interactive film um, attracts people like me, you know, the dregs of society, you know, the, the, you know, the desperate, the, the incompetent, you know, so people like me. And so, you know, we like, we get a few bucks and we come in and we think, yeah, we can do this thing. How hard can it be? Um, and so then we do it and then we screw it up. And then, and then we say, oh, well, this is a complete load of rubbish. What's the reason? Well, because interactive film sucks. Um, and so I'm, so coming back to your excellent point, Brian, when you say that there's a lack of data, for sure. And the tragedy is that Netflix, after all their investment, in my humble opinion, they're not going to have any useful data because the creative that they're building their data on is fundamentally flawed in its understanding of how interactive film works. So two things are here. One is the lack of know-how. And the second thing is the lack of, it's like you don't know what you don't know and this is why data analytics and having great data analysis is so important. If you don't know what questions to ask, you're not going to have answers that are going to drive you forward. And that's There's something it's wrong too, though, right? I think that it's a little bit zeitgeisty. It's a little bit trendy. I've seen calls for briefs for interactive. So like Martin, you said like about the kind of the misnomer, if you like, the interactive film sucks. Interactive anything sucks if it's not really got a sense of genuine interaction and there's zero consequence or zero jeopardy. So interactive in anything is terrible if it feels like it's puppet mastered, if it feels like there's an illusion of interactivity rather than that genuine call. So I think combined with everything you've both identified as a potential problem, there's also the lack of understanding about storytelling which is what I think you've done so well with what you have created, but also this sense of you kind of, I feel, tested some of this in almost like a pantomime fashion with the shout-out interaction, right? And we're talking about some of the earlier films that you made in cinemas with glow sticks for people to actually make their choice and show where their allegiances lie. And I know personally for me, as I transitioned from book to play and to theatre, into television or to screen based that jump from book to theater i realized i did not know my audience at all and i didn't know how they reacted in the moment in real time so i think that there's a lot of stuff in this pot that we're stirring up of why and where there are potential problems with interactivity because i was so frustrated with bandersnatch i like the concept i could see the design thinking underneath as to why certain choices were timed at certain places but it made me literally just want to click anything, almost to be disruptive and mess it up as much but as... But that's the point of Bandersnatch. It's not trying to be a good film. It's trying to be a brilliant, ironic model of a of a 1980s choose your own adventure book, you know, warts and all. So, but yeah, but you raise an excellent point. I mean, the thing that I would say about story with regard to interactive films is that, um, as you know, 
the great majority of story stories are not interactive. I think we can agree on that. Uh, but real life is always interactive. So my starting point is always, I'm not telling a story, I'm making a model of real life. It might end up being a story, <laughs> but that's not where I start. So Lifesaver is not a story about someone who has a cardiac arrest and then someone else saves them and hopefully I can get to the happy ending where the person is saved. Lifesaver is a model of a little bit of real life. And the choices that I give the user are not story choices. They are choices that in real life I would have to take if I was to save the life of that person. So it comes round to being a story in the end. But I think in terms of fundamental concept, uh, that is the key thing. Try to make something which is not a story, but is a model of real life. And then the way that you can interact with what is happening in this model of real life, that sort of comes naturally. Because you're not trying to think of story points, you're just thinking of things that you would have to do in real life to get to where you want to be. Well, we're at the end of our first segment, and it's interesting because, you know, one thing Allison and I pride us on it, pride ourselves on is that we go with the flow of the discussion. So we haven't even had a chance to, to talk about your work in specific, which is what we will do when we come back. And we have a, a couple of examples as well. So for us, we're taking a break right now for the audience. They're taking a week break right now, which is for <laughs> us. Um, but we will all be dressed the same for the comfort of our audience and continuity sake. And we'll be right back next week with Martin Percy to talk more about, specifically about his creativity, the work that he's done and interactive filmmaking. So join us next week. We'll see you for right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Be sure to subscribe.